Welcome to Falls Count Anywhere podcast. I am Charlie Turner here along with Chris DiCarlo on this birthday edition, if you will, yes. of Falls Count Anywhere. As humble as I am, I will let you know that it's my birthday today, and uh, yesterday was Chris's birthday. Uh, we are not related, by the way, but <laughs> birthday is a day apart. A couple of Tauruses here, a couple of bulls in That's the, the old China shop. That's the way it goes shop, in the month right? of April for us. That's right, man. Uh, so yeah, we have a birthday edition of uh, Falls Gone Anywhere today. It's starting to warm up out there a little bit, too. Yeah, man. Uh, the snow's gone, which is good, and uh, hopefully we're going to finally get a real spring here as we uh, head into uh, the latter part of April and into May. Uh, but before we, um, we want to, of course, bring in our guest for today. We're happy to have him here with us. He is part of the AWA Unleashed podcast. He's completing the trifecta for us here on Falls Count Anywhere, as we've already had Mr. Christopher Tubbs, Mr. Mick Karch uh, joining us. We have the, uh, the third member of that podcast. He is a wrestling historian, wrestling expert, if you will. He is Mr. George Shire. Uh, George, thank you so much for joining us today on our podcast. How are you today, sir? I'm very good. Pleasure to be on your show. Thank you for reaching out to us. Absolutely. Absolutely a pleasure. And, uh, you know, uh, George, we want to, you know, from watching your podcast, AWA Unleashed, um, definitely want, want you to get, you know, tell our audience about that a little bit because it's uh, pretty awesome. You guys just recently did a show uh, on Kurt Hennig recently and, and whatnot and uh, some other shows with uh, with some great guests that you guys have booked in the past. Uh, can you tell us a little bit? And, and for anybody listening, um, you could catch this on YouTube, on Spotify, Apple iTunes. And George, can you tell us a little bit more about the AWA podcast? I know you guys got some big things coming up this year. You have a live appearance coming up in June uh, that you're gonna be doing uh, ahead of a uh, MAW show. Uh, so you can just tell us a little bit more about uh, what's on the agenda for 2022. Well, wow, you've pretty much covered it already. The, uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> AWA. AWA, you know, when you talk about the old territories back in the day, uh, the AWA was a place that every wrestler of any note wanted to come and work for back in the, the 60s, 70s, and into the early 80s. It was just a good pay territory. It was a good travel territory, uh, easy schedules for the guys, but top talent from openers to main events all the time. And basically anybody who was anybody in the business at one time or another appeared in the AWA and even before that when it was NWA territory out of Minneapolis uh, anybody in the business was really on on tap for us so it was a show that we wanted to do uh, for a long time and, and we just had the right guy come along our buddy Chris Tubbs and Chris is a producer at one of our local Minneapolis uh, radio stations here in the Twin Cities and he said he'd do it for us and Without him, Mick and I wouldn't be able to do it because I can't move a mouse without blowing up my computer. And uh, Mick is probably in the same boat. So, But we love old school AWA, and we've been trying hard to bring the fans what they want. Uh, we did just finish Kurt Hennig, as you said. And uh, yesterday we taped a show with Barbara Goodish, the uh, widow and wife of the late King Kong Bruiser Brody. Had a great wow. show with her sharing a lot of stories and memories and we've got other things coming up down the road uh we're hoping to have the boogie boogie man on jimmy valiant and uh not to mention just the stuff that mick and i do about reflecting and collecting and sharing memories yeah so that, thank that's, you guys for letting me plug that absolutely yeah and that's what we enjoy um you know again we talk about the classics here and, and, and listening to your show you know for example uh i was listening to part one a little bit of part one of the kurt henning show and the match that I wasn't completely familiar with, as you know, I'm hosting a wrestling show, I should know this stuff, right? But the, uh, well, the that's match, why I'm here, right? That's right. The rest, our wrestling, our personal wrestling historian here. Um, but the match with Kurt Henning and Nick Bockwinkle, and, and and the way you guys talked up that match, how it just featured pretty much everything in an hour long match. So it got me intrigued because I never saw that match in its entirety, and I, I, I didn't watch it from start to finish, but I watched large chunks of it. Holy cow, that match was amazing. And um, if you're if you're not familiar with some of the the talent that came through AWA, uh, George here along with Mick and, and Christopher Tubbs, they, they will present that to you. Um, George, I got to ask you, as far as um, when you got involved into the wrestling business, what was it that you know caught your interest, and what, and how did you get so deep into it to where now you're, you're like an expert in that area? Well, you know, a lot of things in life just happen. Um, the older I get the more I realize that uh, there are little puzzle pieces that fall into place that you didn't have a place for in the past, you know, it all comes together. But, you know, my story is like a lot of people, uh, Mick Karch and I, we share the same story. We were, we were young kids, eight, nine, 10 years old. 
and we found wrestling on the tube and became addicted to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my story is a lot longer than that and in depth. I mean, but for me, wrestling has always been a tonic. It's been a, it's been something I can turn to back in the old days with pro wrestling. Uh, long story short, I had a very troubled childhood, uh, shipped around to foster homes, never feeling like I belonged. And ro pro wrestling traveled that road with me and kept me sane so that I didn't do anything that a lot of kids end up doing in life, you know, getting in the wrong, wrong pack of kids or into drugs or whatever. And pro wrestling was the drug that I chose. So then I get to know the guys, uh, the, the wrestlers, they, they see you around enough and before you know it, they respect you and trust you. And back in that era, it was tough with kayfabe. But I had some, some great heroes and guys that, uh, as a teenager, uh, allowed me to be part of their scene. Guys like Red Bastine and, and uh, Dr. X, Dick Byer, the Destroyer, for those fans that know him under whatever name. But uh, so many wrestlers, Larry Hennig, all of them became personal friends. And as the rest comes, I, I enjoy doing results. I, I, I like to do results records of wrestlers. The one thing I learned early on is they tell stories because you see where the uh, the wrestlers have worked. They're a heel in one town, a baby in another. They use this name in one town, that name in another town. Uh, they were on the top of the card here and the bottom of the card there. Feuds, rivalries, so results are a blast. And I've done, uh, boy, I tell you, I've done about 75, give or take, life results records of various old school wrestlers. They're never finished. Mm -hmm. because you always come across another result or two. And then I'm like a little kid on Christmas morning opening up a present, you know, like, right. whoa, <laughs> what did I find here? But, uh, yeah, that's that's my passion. History is my passion. And uh, then doing these podcasts and sharing the stories with people and fans who, you know, they remember it, but they didn't save things. They didn't, you know, get as crazy about it as I did. So it's fun to share. Yeah, and that's um, absolutely, and, and and you know, as I was digging into some of the AWA history, um, you know, and I, I know a few, uh, some things here and there, but as I dug deeper into it, and some of the things I didn't realize, and I wanted to ask you your opinion on it, um, Hulk Hogan, um, he was given the title twice in AWA, but it was quickly removed from him, and eventually, of course, as we know, he went to WWF and, and blew up there. Um, do you think there's any a any regret on AWA's part for not giving uh, the uh, the Hulkster there a long title run at the time where he was appearing in Rocky Three and whatnot, or or it just happened the way it happened and Vince McMahon just took it to another level? You know that that's an age old question, and man, I'll tell you, what, we have discussed that, and everyone has discussed the Hulk Hogan situation in the AWA. Those two uh, title things that you spoke of. You know, those were the typical tease finishes that were so well known back in the kayfabe era. The fans at the arena saw the good guy win. They went home believing he did. But later on, you know, the proverbial, they looked at the tapes and they saw this or saw that and the decision was reversed. I mean, that wasn't that wasn't just something in those two matches. That was very common in pro wrestling back then. It was a way to get fans to come back next week or next month to the next house show. And the, the deal with Hulk Hogan, guys, you know, perhaps in hindsight, uh, Vern and Greg, you know, Vern's no longer with us now, but, you know, perhaps in hindsight, they, they could say, well, yeah, maybe we pulled the major boo-boo here. But generally speaking, the general consensus is that at the time when Hogan was at his peak with the AWA, Vern had the gold mine in Nick Bockwinkel and Bobby Heenan together, and yeah. Nick was the champion. And he just wasn't going to give it to a non-wrestler in the case of what Hogan was. Hogan was a character, very charismatic one. And there's no doubt that he had the fan support. Right. But with his travels to Japan and with his his schedule and and pretty much being an outsider to the AWA, Vern wasn't going to put it on him. Now we know in hindsight that Vince came in, Vince McMahon Jr., and he promised Hogan the moon. Uh, he delivered on it, giving him the title and things. 
But, uh, you know, again, with that invasion that he started of the territories, and he, Vince McMahon robbed the AWA probably more than any other territory at the time. Yeah. But Vince was hell-bent on going national. Vince was his poster boy, made sense. And at the time, the old guard of promoters, and I mean, this is the truth of the matter, guys. The old guard of the promoters, Ganya, any other promoter in the country, Paul Bosch, Don Owen, Roy Shire, Sam Muchnick, Eddie Graham, and we can go on and on. They were old school in their thinking. They had done the same thing the same way for 20 years. And they just did not see the train coming down the track. And Vince McMahon blindsided them and they, fi they figured he was gonna fail. Mm -hmm. And so even when those promoters guys tried to work together, some of them, Jerry Jarrett and Vern Gagne and Jerry Lawler and uh, Jim Crockett was involved. Um, they couldn't work together because they each had their own egos and they wanted their boys on the card put over everyone else. So, you know, would it have been different if, uh, you know, maybe they would have taken the chance and put the ho the title on Hogan? Hindsight 2020, we don't know. Right. But I, yeah. I honestly believe that uh, what was going to happen, happened. And Vince had youth on his side. He was 33 years old, thereabouts at the time in 1984-85. So, and he had the money. And he didn't care if he failed. So, end result, it is what it is. It turned out the way it did. I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. And I think, Chris, you would agree that, uh, and, and George, maybe you would agree too, that WWF back at that time, it was more, because with AWA, as you mentioned, the technical wrestling was, was what it was about. And with WWF, it was more about the show, you know, WrestleMania, the, the promotion the promotion leading up to it and whatnot. And I guess, Chris, you would probably agree, too. It was more about the pomp and circumstance with Vince McMahon than it was. Yeah, and it kind of still is today. And uh, uh, George, like I said, I've been a fan since 1980. I was five years old. I caught the bug, too, watching uh, AWA. We got to watch some AWA on our local Cable 3. We got to watch a little Florida. We got Mid-Atlantic every day at 3 o'clock. And then, of course, we had WWF on at midnight on WWOR here in the uh, western New York area. So uh, I wish I had a VCR, though, from 80 to 87. <laughs> I have even more footage. I mean, that would be really good. But um, I don't know. That's why I don't watch today. I, I like AEW, I like the NWA, but I don't watch WWE too much because it's just the same old matches. That's just not, it's not old school and that's what I'm about. And, yeah, do you uh, watch today's uh, product there, George? You know, I, I peek in once in a great while. The other night I tuned in to AEW for a few minutes. I do tune in to Raw maybe for a few minutes. But, you know, guys, it's not my cup of tea, and I can't follow it, either. any of them. I just can't follow it today. I don't begrudge anybody for what they watch and what they enjoy. Everybody's got their own generation and time, and that's cool. You know, uh, Chris, I think you touched on something when you were talking about all of the various TV outlets that in the 80s we were starting to get as fans. Um, pro wrestling, as I knew it back in the in the late 50s through the 60s and the 70s, you know, we only had three or four TV stations in our town. And, and that's the way it was in most cities. You know, yeah. some cities only had two stations. One of them carried wrestling. And wrestling was able to be guarded in those days in the sense that what I saw on my all-star wrestling, I had no idea that these guys traveled around the country and were wrestling in, you know, 26 different territories and that there was, you know, they might have tag teamed last night and they're wrestling each other tonight. We yeah. had no way of knowing that or finding out. It was a very small world, but in the in the late 70s when the VCRs and, and cable television started to come around, um, the business started to change because now here in the Twin Cities, I could watch TBS, the uh, wrestling out of Atlanta, I could get some of the stations that you said you you got. You know, we got the Von Erich territory, and and so it was changing in a way that uh, the business was going to change 
probably as it ended up turning out, whether or not Vince McMahon was the man to, to pull that first, shoot that first bullet, you know. And uh, that's the major difference. And when you talk about the AWA, um, Charlie, you mentioned this about the AWA having more wrestling, or Chris, maybe it was you. Yep. The um, Vern emphasized pro wrestling or real wrestling first, coming up with a character second. He wanted his boys to go into the ring and put on a good wrestling car, a good wrestling show. And, you know, if he had the characters, that was fine. Um, I was talking with a guy just the other day about Rick Martell. Mm. Now, Ricky Martell was a very talented, scientific, the term they use, wrestler. He could wrestle. And if he had one drawback, it was his ability on the microphone. He didn't come across as being, you know, having that oomph. But in the ring, he was the real deal and very talented. We saw him go to the WWF and yeah, he was there for a while with Tito Santana, which by the way, was a team that they stole from Vern because Martell and Santana had been a team in the AWA. Yes, I got but that match. All of a sudden, yeah, and it's a great match. Great matches against the High Flyers. Yes. But what they then did was change Rick Martell into this character, the model. Yeah. And I, I just cringed. Um, you know, I think Martell did the best that he could with it. But it, wa it was so demeaning in hindsight to a talented performer that Rick was. And that's really the way I've seen Vince McMahon work through the years that he's interested in characters rather than wrestlers. If he can put a clown suit on somebody and, and hopefully make a buck with them, he'll try to do it. Join <laughs> the clown, right. you know? Yeah, yeah, but exactly. I mean, he's, taken, he, he's had success, believe me. I mean, you, nobody could ever knock his stone cold Steve Austin. I mean, that gimmick took off and it, it's one of the great successes. But generally speaking, every wrestler that would walk into the WWF or WWE office. I think that Vince is just thinking in his mind, what can I do to this guy? Hmm. Well, what can I create out of him? He's and, ruined um, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And Vern Gagne, on the other hand, he never looked at putting a, a clown suit on a guy or, or, or dressing him up as, you know, have him be a, a feminine character or anything like that. Um, he wanted the wrestlers to come in and, create their own identity, uh, be themselves. And if they got over well, that's great. And if they didn't, Vern would, Vern and, and so many of the boys that he had on the roster at the time would work with him. And so like when the, you look at the talent, like. I'm sorry, like the Crusher, like the Baron Von Raschke and, and so on and so forth. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, and I also like the old AWA, George, remember in the studio with uh, Roger Kent on the call, All-Star Wrestling, and then they had me and Gene doing the interviews. One of the things I brought up to uh, Mr. Karch was uh, so many classic angles uh, the AWA had, and we're going to see a couple of them later on in the show with my clips. But uh, Bobby Heenan breaking Buck Zumhoff's radio over the steel post, uh, just... <laughs> A lot of great things came out of the AWA, not just wrestlers. And I know Vern trained a lot of big names, as we all know, too. Well, you know, Vern always believed in having a story be told. And, and, and to be fair, most of the old school promoters and bookers, they, they did the same thing in that era. They wanted to, they wanted to tell a, a story to the fans, and they were able to carry that story through to the finish. Um, a lot of times they promoted backwards. If they wanted to have a cage match in April, they would start a feud in September, the, the, the back year, and go forward with it each match building up to that blow off match. But each match in each city told a story. And like you say, with the breaking of the, uh, the boom box, you know, well, obviously that's gonna, that's gonna cause some friction. And when you talk about working a storyline when, uh, you know, they had, Bobby Heenan and Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens uh, triple teaming on Greg Gagne. And lo and behold, Larry the Axe Hennig, the Gagne's mortal enemy at that time, comes to Greg's rescue. And we've talked about that one on our podcast. But those are things that tell a story and get fans involved. They, uh, 
They worked out an angle. We mentioned Dick Byer, Dr. X, a few moments ago. They worked out a storyline on TV where Ray Stevens broke Dr. X's leg. And the reality was, behind the scenes, which fans never knew, Dick Byer needed some knee surgery. And he was going to have it and be out of action for a couple of months. So what do they do on TV? They have Ray Stevens attack Dr. X, come off the top rope on his knee, because he's tangled up in the ropes. He takes the ring bell and hits his knee, allegedly breaks his leg. And you know, oh my God, fans, you know, Dr. X is out of action. Ray Stevens is boasting, I hope I crippled him for life. Well, here's the story. They've already got a ready-made feud now for when, when Dick, or Dick Byer, he was Dr. X. So when the doc comes back, he wants revenge. This guy broke my leg. This guy caused me to lose money. It's so perfect. Right, that's of course. That's the way they promote it. That's the Let way they promote you, it all the time. Let me ask you this, George, and, and kind of a two-part question. Um, cause one thing that drives me nuts about Vince McMahon, I mean, let's face it, I mean, he's done a wonderful job for the wrestling business. But one thing that drives me nuts in 2022, and, and this is prior to this um, as well, is there's forbidden words in WWE. For example, they can't use the word wrestler. They have to use the word sports entertainer. So AEW makes a point to call it pro wrestling, wrestlers. I want to know your opinion on that. And also, as you mentioned with the storylines, is there, back in the day, even with us growing up, there was maybe four pay-per-views a year at the most. Do you think there's too many pay-per-views to where these storylines get watered down now? Or don't have enough time to get built up, I should say? Well... I think the main problem today, and for what little I have followed it recently, um, I think the storylines don't have a chance to get to the finish because sometimes they run into issues behind the scenes with the guys and the guys are gone or they have to abort something along the way. And yeah, I don't know about pay-per-views. You know, they, they took the place of the arena show, of course, as time evolved, because we used to just get on TV we would have what we called squash matches. You know, you'd have the main event star like a Nick Bockwinkle go in and wrestle against a Kenny J. And nobody ever expected Kenny J to win. You know, he was one of those, as they called the jobber. Um, we call them enhancement talent. They've been called carpenters because a lot of times they did a lot of things to help those guys get over too. 100%, you know, the main yeah. stars. But that was their job. Their job was to lose, thus the name jobber. And then the wrestler, in this case, if it was Nick Bockwinkle, he'd win that match, come out to the interview area era, and he'd have to uh, have maybe two minutes, three minutes at most, to get his match in the arena against the crusher or whoever it was going to be, to get the fans to want to come to that arena by what he said or what he did on that interview. And when you got done listening to him, you wanted to do what Marty O'Neill, our announcer, used to say, run, don't walk, to get your tickets. And that was what television did in those days. Um, the the pay-per-view thing, boy, I'll tell you what, when they started coming out in the late 80s and into the 90s, I used to get together with some friends and we'd, we'd order the pay-per-view and I was following Absolutely. it. Yeah. But I mean, eventually, um, yeah, watered down, as you called it. I, I just think there were too many characters. And then to answer your sports entertainment versus wrestler, um, I think that's the thing that Vince has been most honest with us about. He, he never promised us wrestling matches. He never promises us wrestlers. He promises us characters. He promises us skits and vignettes and long drawn out uh, interviews on, on television. You know, and he, he comes true with what he says. It's, it's sports entertainment. And when you actually get to the match in the ring, the matches are usually, you know, two or three minutes if they're that. And then they're left with more talking between the right. wrestlers and that sort of thing. So I think the products today are as different as the old proverbial apples and oranges. And uh, if you lived my era, you can you can understand the difference. If you didn't live my era, you're not going to get it. But that's okay. The kids today, I know a lot of people 
you know, Chris, you said you started in 1980. And I know a lot of people who uh, started becoming fans around that time because it was a wrestling boom all over the country in 1980, 81, 82, 83. You know, Vern Gagne had his most successfully financial year in the AWA in 1982. And that was credited to Hogan, Jerry Blackwell, Sheik Adnan Casey, all of the other talent that he had. But it was also big all over the country. You know, the, the, the younger fans were coming out. Chris, you said you were five years old in 80? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So the, the kids that are five years old up to, say, 13, 14 were starting to becoming fans. And all of those wrestlers that were active at that time became their heroes. My era was really starting to end because my wrestlers, my heroes, the Vern Gagnes, the Crushers, the Bruisers, Dick Byer, Billy Red Lions, Cowboy Bill Watts, you know, Larry Hennig, Nick Bockwinkle, Mad Dog Vashad. I mean, we can go on. Well, all of these guys had been in the business now for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. And so they were older. And there was a new breed of wrestlers coming up all over the country. You had Hulk Hogan, you had Junkyard Dog, you had the Freebirds, you had the Fabulous Ones, you had the Rock and Roll Express, you had Magnum TA. I mean, anywhere you went, there was a new breed. And so your generation, Chris, coming up, it was inevitable that, you know, it would prevail and take over because my guys were either getting older and passing on or just quitting. Yeah, yeah George, real quick, I want to mention, um... Of course, I got a lot of history too, and you you talk about uh, results. I uh, with my DVD collection, I call it match listing, where I uh, every MSG card or whatever TV show, I got exactly what's on that DVD. And uh, his wife loves it, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I say that extremely hey, if your wife loves it, that's part. Of... <laughs> Guys, well, if she... your wife loves it, that's part of the deal. Because right, right. I met my wife a year before I dated her we were friends then we dated but our first date and i'm not ashamed to say this our first date was a wrestling card and i did that on purpose because <laughs> i was so enamored with wrestling and that if i was going to be with anybody that i was going to be long term with i had to have her be on board there and here we are coming up on 49 years later and she's tolerated this crazy world i live in so god bless her Yes, Chris, God, you God bless right? you both. Yes, yeah. uh, this year will be 24 years we've been married. Congratulations. And yes, awesome, thank man. you. It's awesome. just, uh, you know, it's always a, a, a work, though. You know, got to <laughs> always work at it. And uh, yes, uh, that was the same thing when I met uh, my wife-to-be. Wrestling has been my life since 1980, and I'm not going to change it for nobody. And uh, real yeah. quick, though, George, uh, I have some of that footage from the St. Paul Civic Center and those cards like Star Cage 85. I got wrestling for the cure in 85. A lot of my favorite though was not only the AWA studio with all-star wrestling, but I liked a lot of that stuff that came out of Winnipeg. Such great oh, matches sure. and great TV. Wow. Like even me and Gene Okerlin on the call of Dino Bravo versus Crusher Blackwell. Yes. Yeah. And you know, Gene Okerlund was, a, was another guy who, if you looked at his style, I mean, I grew up first with Marty O'Neill, who was a lot calmer and a lot more, um, well, I, I don't know, he, he was just a different type of an announcer. And Gene took it to another level. Uh, Gene was a great announcer. He, had a, he was a radio personality long before he got into the television part of it. And uh, he brought a little bit of the carny to pro wrestling. He was able to get uh, bring himself into the picture a little bit with the guys. And he was the perfect announcer to go with Vince McMahon when Vince started his his national expansion. Yeah. I don't think without Vince McMahon, you know, we say Hogan was one of the primary reasons. I, I don't think without uh, without Gene Okerlund, he could have done it successfully as well either. Gene True. was perfect. True. Real quick, though, too, George, I just wanted to mention... Um... Oh my God, it just slipped my mind because uh -oh, I got so, well, yeah, so much classic. Think about that for a second, Chris, my but, mind. but George, what I want to ask you about, because you were talking about the differences in uh, generations and brings up a good point. It made me, got me to thinking here with the, uh, with today, you know, you can go on the internet, you can look up any wrestler and get all the information, whatever the case, but back in the eighties, before all of that, 
you know, whether it was AWA, NWA, whatever We were watching every week waiting. Right. You're either waiting or um, you're not really getting any information on these guys unless you go to the magazine rack, you know, Pro Wrestling Illustrator or whatever the case to read up on these guys. And a lot of them, like I didn't really, I wasn't 100% familiar with Ric Flair back in like 85, 86. And I was maybe sure. eight, nine years old. And you see him at the top of the list every week in the NWA. And it's like, well, who is this Ric Flair? And then you see pictures of him in the magazine. So that difference of we're kind of take away the element of surprise these days with the internet. You can't keep anything a secret compared to back then, those that generation gap. It really is a different uh, playing field for, for wrestling fans and for the wrestlers themselves. Well, you know, I did a little, a little bit different than some fans did. Um, most fans that were my age when I got the wrestling bug were, they'd go to the matches, they'd go home and they'd forget about them. And I'd leave the arena and I would see their program crumpled up on the floor with their pop spilled on it, you know, they, they just went mm -hmm. home. I was crazy. I bought a wrestling program and I was going to save it. And then, and you know, guys, I started buying 5, 10, 15, 20 programs at a wrestling card. And I started trading programs with fans in different cities all around the country. So I was starting to, long before Cabe Fabe was ever, uh, you know, let the, when it was not there anymore, I knew what was going on in California or Tampa or Houston because I got the programs from those territories and I built a collection that way. And I started doing the results, as I told you, were so important. I used to have to go to the library. And I did this so much, spent so much time at the school library because I was, you know, still a teenager then. And I'd go on Saturdays to the public library and spend time going through newspapers, looking for results. And it was always fun because I'd find, I'd find towns that I didn't know were towns, much <laughs> less finding a wrestling result there on some guy I'm researching. Right. And I got to know when guys worked in the territory, you know, if they worked there for a year in 62, well, that's what I'm hunting for. And so that was a little bit different, but I had to work hard to do that. And like you say, Charlie, today you just Google and, you know, you come up with something on the Internet. Hopefully it's it's truthful. I mean, not everything is accurate on the Internet. Correct. Wikipedia yep. <laughs> being one of the worst sources for, for pro wrestling. But the bottom line is um, it is a little bit easier today than it was in my era. And I had to either witness a match, have a friend that totally witnessed it and could relay that it happened and the way it happened, you know, the result was the way it was. Or I had to get the programs and things from it or do that newspaper research. And that's exactly what I did for for 25 years. And so it was, it was a lot of hard work, but it's something I enjoy doing. And then when I share them with the wrestlers, you know, I've given, I've given wrestlers their results records and they just, they, they can't believe it because they forgot all this stuff. And they'll oh, sit down awesome. and start telling, they'll, they'll sit down and start telling me stories. And of course, then there's Nick Bockwinkle, who, one of my favorite friends of all time. I mean, God, I love that. I love that guy and I miss him. But the very first time I handed him his results record that I had compiled up to that point in time, he just looked at me with that snarky look on his face and he said, you're sick <laughs> but but going forward nick was the guy that called me often and said you know what year did i wrestle in and he'd give me a city and i'd tell him well you were there in 62. okay did i ever wrestle so and so yeah you did and we'd talk about that so the guys really appreciate it that's mean, awesome yeah and that's where the results come from so i think i hope sure. i answered your question Absolutely. Yeah, now I remembered yeah. my point here for George. Uh, I got uh, some of that early Nick Bockwinkel footage there from the late 60s, which is great. And then his father footage, too. But, uh, right. George, I wanted to uh, get your opinion uh, on the two different announcers back in the AWA between Roger Kent and Raj Trongard. Uh, two very different, distinctive ways to call a match. Both did it very good. Uh, most people, most of the younger fans, let's say pre, oh, probably pre 80s, will remember Roger Kent. And uh, Roger had a series of regular cliches that he would use that fans became familiar with. You know, when the, when the ring was uh, 
all pandemonium was breaking loose, you know, Roger would blurt out that Katie bar the door. <laughs> and uh, Larry Hennig, he'd introduce as being bigger, to, you know, bigger, or he's big enough to go bear hunting with a switch. <laughs> and I mean, but yeah, and Rod Trongard was also very good at calling a match, I think had his own distinctive style. Both of those guys had great radio voices. That's where they originated from, both in the, in the Twin City market and, and surrounding area. So I think they were both very good. Roger Kent was with the AWA from 1962 on. So he had a good run. And the AWA was, was started in, uh, in August of 60. Marty O'Neill had been going since the mid fifties with the uh, Minneapolis territory. Well, wow, great. George, I, um, you know, I we can go on and on yeah, all day, right? My gosh, I could, I could, I, I'm here guys. I have, a cold, I have a cold, I have a cold and I don't feel good, but I'm talking wrestling. So I feel better. Oh, Hey man, man. as long as that helps make you feel better, that makes us feel better, you know, cause, uh, yeah. we, we can talk wrestling all day, man, but we, we certainly appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your day today to, to talk some classic wrestling with us. Those stories that we hear. And again, we'd love to have you back to, to ask you some more questions about back in the day. Cause we love hearing happy about to. it. That would anytime, be awesome. Anytime, if it works, I'd be happy to, guys. Oh, fantastic, right, sir. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. And, folks, again, if you haven't heard it yet, AWA Unleashed Podcast. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple iTunes. It's pretty awesome. Mr. Shire here along with uh, Mick Karch and Christopher Tubbs that uh, produces it. I it's watch it every show. Tuesday night yeah. on YouTube, and then I, I uh, message Chris Tubbs, and what a great show. And uh, you got, I'm a fan. Yeah, something that we that we learn from, too, uh, from watching it. So we, uh, we suggest that if you haven't seen it, go check it out because it's awesome. George, thank you so much uh, for taking some time out today, sir, and joining us on False Count Anywhere. And again, sir, we hope to have you back, but have a great weekend. You too, guys, and thank you so much. You do a great job. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very much. All right, that is Mr. George Sire, and uh, we're going to take a quick break here on Gorillas Inc. as we uh, let our sponsors come in and show you what they're all about. we got some new ones, too. Wait, uh, we're going to fire those up, so uh, join us. We'll be right back. Thank you. should have the opportunity to enjoy this wonder of nature. The Autism Nature Trail at Letchworth will provide ADA-compliant accessibility and allow those with autism, as well as visitors of all ages and abilities, to push boundaries, explore new activities, and develop skills. Go to AutismNatureTrail.com to learn more, and please help support this important project. <laughs>
right, welcome back. And again, we want to mention those new sponsors along with our uh, sponsors that we've had all along. Thank you so much for the, uh, those. And um, Check out our Gorilla Zinc store. All Gorilla kinds Zinc of merchandise yeah, is just it's... blowing up. And uh, we, we appreciate all the viewers and everybody uh, checking it out. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Good stuff. Um, but yeah, we want to definitely uh, touch base on a little bit of uh, current wrestling. We had Raw here, Monday Night Raw. WWE was here in Buffalo uh, this past Monday. Saw that. Uh, a little recap of that. I'll tell you what; these guys had a lot of fun with the crowd uh, taking shots at Buffalo. Uh, edge. One of the yeah, Edge. We'll get to in a second, but one of the comments, and I can't remember who said what, but a couple of the comments that stood out were freaking hilarious to me. Uh, Buffalo being the uh, rusted out suburb of New York City, <laughs> or uh, Canada's landfill, uh, if you will. So. Aye. And then Edge, of course, gets on the mic and uh, stated that unlike the Buffalo Bills and the Buffalo Sabers, he actually wins championships. Well, hopefully Josh Allen will have a say in that this year. Uh, we'll see. Yes. Um, but the cool thing was Cody Rhodes uh, was part of the opening of the show with Seth Rollins. And the reason I mention this is and he gave Buffalo a lot of love uh, because one of the last appearances with his brother and his father took place right here in Buffalo at his event I was at. Robin, uh, we were talking off the air uh, before the show was an event you were at as well. Mm -hmm. This was WWE Battleground back in 2013 when the Rhodes family took on the Shield. And um, at the end of the match, it was like a, it was a win for the for the Rhodes brothers, and a, a big just a thank you moment to their dad, Dusty Rhodes, the legendary Dusty Rhodes. Yes. And one of the last times the three of them uh, were in the ring together, uh, and, and in a pay per view capacity as well. So Cody acknowledged that on last week's Monday Night Raw. He said to Buffalo fans, "If you know, you know," and that's what he was referring to. And uh, we just—I'm glad I was able to be a part of that. I didn't—you don't realize it at the time, of course, he didn't as well. That's the last time you're going to see those three in the ring together. But um, very, very cool. It looked like a good crowd there at, at, at the uh, Key Bank Center. Um, I should know yes, that. It was. I have an affiliation with Key Bank, if you will. Um, but yeah, they—they uh, they put on a good show there and um, looked like it was a good time. But they, uh, they had some fun with the crowd. I thought that was pretty hilarious. And of course, we mentioned Chris too. It is our birthdays today, uh, or well, my birthday today, your birthday yes, yesterday. yesterday. Uh, also, some birthday shout outs to Mr. John Cena. Um, his birthday is actually the same exact birthday as mine, 42377. We're the same exact age. I'm in a little better shape than Cena, you know, maybe I'll wow. catch up. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, right, in my own mind, right? Um, also, uh, Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, she turns 31 today. And Tony Atlas uh, turns 77 today. So happy birthday to all of them as well. Um, now, well, we do know that our boy, the Sheik, he just turned 80. As well, we bring before, in our guy, yeah, uh, before John, that, we bring in our friend John Restaino here. John Restaino, but, John. Uh, real quick, uh, guys, uh, I saw, uh, which should be interesting, uh, towards the end of June, we're going to have AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling join together for the oh, Forbidden, the Forbidden Door, Door pay-per-view. Uh, wow. Sunday, June the 26th in Chicago. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw that, and I was like, wow, that, you know, that's a great idea. Hopefully, I'm sure it will be good. Very cool. And, you know... It, as you mentioned that, um, I know I've, I've taken a couple shots at Adam Cole. I'm not like a huge fan of his. Not, not for any particular reason. He's just, you know, kind of a smaller guy. He's starting to grow on me, right? He's the one that did the announcement. Uh, he, like Tony Khan came out oh, to yeah. do the announcement, and then Adam Cole kind of stole it from him and did the announcement. And I was like, you know, the, the charisma and, and the ring presence of Adam Cole is pretty impressive. He's not the biggest guy in the world, but you know what? In today's wrestling, that really doesn't matter. Um, he, he's growing on me on a side note. But anyway, yeah, the AEW Forbidden uh, Forbidden Door pay-per-view with New Japan taking place in Chicago. Man, they, they have a huge possibility of a lot of matches they could do. Yeah, and I probably, John, I bet you uh, we're going to have uh, AEW champion and CM Punk, I'm guessing. Wow. Yes, yeah. in Chicago. Yeah. It's going to be, that piques interest, man, the Forbidden Door stuff. I, I love it. Well, that's it's great. great. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, there, there's a date in July that they threw around. We'll get this uh, for the next show lined up. But I believe AEW is returning to Rochester mm -hmm. this summer as well. So um, if you haven't seen AEW live, I haven't yet. Um, it looks like a great time. So uh, we'll keep you updated on those. As we kind of dropped the ball, we forgot to mention, I know we've mentioned it in the past, before the uh, Monday Night Raw show on April 18th, we didn't. We failed to mention it last week, but I don't think Vince needs any help promoting anything from us, right? So <laughs> yeah, I think they're doing just fine on their and own. Real the quick, we got a shout out could, to our WWE. buddy. Uh, speaking of pro wrestling, our buddy, friend of the show, Mr. Sean Kramers. A shout out to him. Yeah, as Sean's he been traveled a busy guy. Uh, yeah. all over the uh, East Coast area here, doing his thing, production and. Uh, wrestling commentating so that's uh great for him yeah absolutely um sean is uh he's 
Every time you see a picture on Facebook, he's at a wrestling show in Elsing, so he's he's doing well, and we're, we hope to have him back to get some updates uh, from our buddy Sean Kramer, absolutely. But John, uh, Chris, of course, mm. uh, it's not a complete show, or it's not a, an official show until we bring in the Iron Sheik and uh, his takes, if you will. And he asked the question, uh, what is your favorite Iranian dish? Mm. I've never had Iranian food in my life. Yeah. Um, John, have you ever? I mean, the, the kebab. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's, shish kebab? Yeah. Is that Iranian? Mm-hmm. I think with lamb, though, yeah. I mean, type okay. stuff. But I like lamb. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, a, hmm. that's about it. I think there's some other, you know what else I think there is? Like those um, tabbouleh. Oh like yeah, or, yeah, yeah. You know, see, then there's different cultures. Yeah. Tabuli I associate with India. See, mm-hmm. then I get lost. I have no idea. Anything uh, non-Italian, I'm gonna have some yeah. questions. You know what I mean? True. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, so that's um, that was pretty funny by the Sheik there. And the Sheik, you know, he um, oh boy, <laughs> he did have a title reign at one point. And uh, the Bovada <laughs> website that he loves to answer questions from, name a sports moment that deserves its own movie. Well, the Sheik, he he beat up that Howdy Doody Bob Backlund. <laughs> At Madison Square Garden to win the championship, they should make a movie out of that. Now, The Sheik does have a documentary uh, out on Netflix, I believe it's, or Prime Video. I did watch it a few years ago. Kind of sad, though, about his daughter there, but... Yeah, yeah, and, um, but The Sheik, if you're going to make a movie about his life, you got to include him beating the snot out of, uh... (laughs) <laughs> Howdy Doody Ooh. Bob Backlund, which is hilarious. Wow. And of course, we want to, as the Sheik never goes a week without um, uh, acknowledging his best buddy, the Hulkster Hulk Hogan. Uh. <laughs> and if he had a nickel for every time he could beat the fuck out of Jabroni Hulk Hogan, he'd be Elon Musk, because that's how many times he would beat the crap out of him. Uh, pretty funny. You know, Elon Musk, of course, yes. in the news trying to buy Twitter and all that stuff. I say let the Sheik buy it. Let the sheep yeah. run Twitter. Oh, boy. Um, and then it said, yeah. you know, you want chaos. Let's get yeah, some real right. chaos, yeah. right? So, oh, boy. Uh, very good stuff there from the Sheik. We we always appreciate the entertainment from his uh, tweets there. But, Chris, uh, the main purpose of our show is the classic wrestling, of course. Uh, you have the vault unloaded for us again this week. Tell us what we got. Yeah, each and every week here, of course, classic clips from my own personal collection, as we say, before we roll them. And we got four clips uh, again this week. And the first we're going to have uh, is a little bit from our guest today, Mr. George Shire. Have you got any letters in the mail yet? Like, hey, stop doing this. We're going to sue your ass. Uh, nothing. And uh, John, we're all good. So uh, good, good, good. maybe because of my disclaimer. Yeah. Right. There we go. But here's a look here at the podcast as we were talking about with Mr. Yes. Shire. A little clip of the uh, AWA Unleash. Yep, they had uh, a couple clips here, quick clips of their show with George, and this one was with uh, Jumpin' Jim Brunzel, which uh, we hope to have on our show someday. What a great guest that would be. And uh, yeah, what a great show, this AWA Unleashed podcast. Like I said, I watch it every Tuesday night on YouTube. Absolutely. And I know it's all over there. Yeah, and anybody listening to us may say, oh, you're just saying that because you had him on the show. Like, no, 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 I'm serious. Like, they they broke down Kurt Henning in two separate shows. And like I said, I I didn't know about the Bachwinkle Kurt Henning match. It was freaking epic, man. That podcast led me to that match. So check it out. It is really great what they bring up. And with George Shire being such a wrestling historian and knowing all this stuff and of course Mick Karch who has foot in the door in the business uh, it still does Uh, they just have a ton of stories and uh, yeah it's a great show good stuff whether they have a guest on or not it's a great show yeah you know speaking of that he's wearing an AWA uh, hoodie there I know Um, I know they're going to be dropping some AWA Unleashed merchandise soon so be on the lookout for that I'd be happy to buy a shirt yeah I said that to Chris Tubbs too the other day yeah I want to we'll buy a shirt and, uh, I still haven't bought a shirt for here yet. Does that I, make, I me know. Bad, uh, make me a bad podcaster? I don't, I don't know. know. Well, I got the AWA on today. <laughs> Wade, Wade might get all gorilla on us again and, and come after me in the middle of the night because I don't know if you saw the little promo Wade did for Gorilla Zinc, but it's pretty freaking awesome. Uh, what do we got here? And here we go, uh, John. Uh, some clips since we were talking AWA today. Some classic AWA clips. Who's this, uh, this was uh, Larry, uh, Kurt's dad, Larry the X heading gear. We saw Angelo. King Kong Mosca smash his hand against the uh, post area there. Yep. Oh, and here uh, we're going to see uh, this is a name from the past, the Mighty Igor wow. from the okay. 70s here, early 80s. But this was a Mighty Igor's take in the AWA doing some uh, feats of strength mm-hmm. and uh, busting up some cinder blocks. The cinder there. blocks oh, yeah. and. Uh, <laughs> This this one here, I, I don't know. Bang over the head with the cinder block. I mean, wow, I guess he was pretty strong, huh? 
we had something similar to that uh, on a previous clip. They were breaking cinder blocks over somebody's chest. Or yeah, we saw like that. <laughs> the super fly Jimmy snuck up, uh, broke him over oh, Ken Patera. And here we right. go. A character of the AWA, a great wrestler in his own right, the Baron Von Raschke. And here we're going to see... Uh, How would you like to meet that guy in a dark there. alley? Oh, oh my there goodness. Goes, uh, yeah. uh, I don't know, a four-inch board of yeah. John over the head from the, yeah. the Russian there. So onto the Baron. Yeah, here we go. Oh, the man. Sickle. Larry Nelson. Timely clip here. <laughs> oh, jeez. No. Oh, look at him screaming. Course, this, uh, this is great. This Larry is Nelson, great. Uh, another uh, commentator voice of the so AWA bad. here. Speaking of which, uh, uh, like the Buckwinkle uh, Henning match, uh, Charlie, this was a classic and a bloodbath at the end here. Um, but what a match between the Midnight Rockers and... Uh, Buddy Rose and Doug Summers back in, this was in 1986 in Las Vegas. Like we said before, uh, Buddy Rose, they're just so out of shape. Yeah, you know right. Just, yeah. Uh, unbelievable. Later on becoming Playboy Buddy Rose. Yeah. yeah, but these two had a few there in 86, 87. That was just uh, crazy. And here, we were talking about uh, early Yokozuna, right? And here he is, known in the AWA as Coquina Maximus. Right. And uh, here he is against Sarge. The Sarge. Here, yeah. This was uh, 1990, towards the end of the AWA. How many folks mm. knew that about him being Samoan? Everybody thought he was Japanese, uh, with the Yokozuna mm. character, of course, and Mr. Fuji. But uh, I didn't realize this until somewhat recently that he was Samoan. Um, and through that cool. Samoan yeah, family knew. tree. Yeah. And here we have a, a four minute uh, barrage of clips, uh, which. I watched from time to time, not only John, but... Oh, these are all the guys that these slammed are all, the Giant. Right, right yeah. all the wrestlers that slammed Andre the Giant. And even before Hulk Hogan did in 1987, That's we're going to see here, Hulk Hogan slams them here from 1980 a few times. I was going to say more than once, yeah. Yes. Hogan slammed them way before, and that's why the WWE kept that footage away from people. Right. Because they didn't want nobody to know Hogan slammed them before 87 there. At Easier WrestleMania to keep 3. that hidden back then, right? Right, but... Uh, Look at the venues. Yeah, I mean, spectrum. this was... Yep, the Spectrum, the Hamburg Fairgrounds. Yeah. It's great. Yep. Oh, the bad back lens. And speaking of, there we go, Hamburg, uh, PA... This was, uh, and I watched this match frequently too. One of my favorite matches, these two. Oh, yeah. Stan Hansen. Ooh, this is a, yeah. I yeah. was surprised to see this one. This. Yeah, me too. Yep. Come out of nowhere. Yeah, a lot of people, like I said, a lot of people have oh, slammed them. That's a good slam too, basically. Yeah. Powerful guy in his own right. Yeah, here we had some, uh, I mean, he was... Some of these wrestlers from all different territories. This was uh, out of Mexico, I believe. Somebody here. Ooh, he struggled a little bit yeah. there. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, he kind of just. Oh. Yeah. Just had a. Yeah. Just had a, yeah. Talk about a 450-pound guy here. Yeah. Some <laughs> of these slams were kind of uh, up a little bit and dump, unlike Hanson's or Hogan's, but. Oh yes, this was a. Uh, uh, this was rare too, out of uh, the Mid South territory, Mid South Wrestling TV. Ooh, wow, he got a good slam out. Yeah, there. and I saw that he helped him out. You see how he he did a kind of yeah, yeah. kind of. He gave him some momentum. A push foot up here. Oh look at that! And here we go again, Hogan uh, slamming the giant from uh, Japan. Oh man! A lot of great matches came out of Japan. Uh, unfortunately, the the Japanese commentary, but you can turn it down. But there's a lot of great matches here. And here, uh, uh, Japanese legend oh, yeah. Antonio Inoki slammed that's the Giant wow. quite a few times. And that's not an overly big dude at uh, yeah, that was slam powerful, so yeah. yeah. That was very good. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you know, a lot of people didn't know about this. Uh, oh, no, this is great. This is unbelievable, actually. A four-minute clip of all the wrestlers that have slammed the Giant. And, uh, wow. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that many. It's great. Yeah. Oh, it's a haircut, man. Ah, yes. We remember that clip. <laughs> the infamous haircut. You know, the interesting thing about, um, you know, Andre getting slammed is Hogan did say to at WrestleMania 3, he felt like his back was just absolutely destroyed after he slammed yeah. him. That was one big unit, you know what I mean? Times so, he'd been slammed and yeah, him too. Yeah, and right. then, uh, yeah, over the years, Andre just kept getting bigger and bigger. So. Right. He never stopped growing. Yeah. Philippines. Right. Part of the disease he fought. I mean, um, by the time, yeah, he got to the 90s, it was 7, 4, 500 plus. Ooh, little, see, you can tell. Yeah, he right struck. There. Oh, here we go. Here we go, the right. WrestleMania 3 slam. Yeah, Hogan said he shredded his back on this one. He felt it. Um, oh, man. WrestleMania 4, and then once again. again, yep. Yep. 
And uh, we're going to hear shortly, we're going to see, I don't know if you knew, Charlie, but oh. the Ultimate Warrior got a few slams yeah. in on a giant over yes, the uh, house shows. This is pre-HD here, folks, so bear with us. And here's one, uh, Madison Square Garden. Oh, oh yeah, the Mighty Warrior. Picks him up. Slam. Down. That's a big one, yeah. And again, from uh, one of our classic venues, Maple Leaf Gardens, Toronto, oh, yeah. Canada. I used to love the runway there. It is. Yes. Yep. There he is. Boom. Oh, he kind of held that for a second, that's too. Heavy. That's the heaviest. Problem. Heenan goes yeah. crazy. The powerful warrior, man. The ultimate yeah, warrior. so that's, uh, that's, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> and then awesome. uh, here we know uh, I'm, I'm a fan of the King, Jerry Lawler. Oh, yeah. Uh, wrestling uh, a great career before commentating but uh and uh robin is a fan and john's a fan now the king brought this clip up specifically after uh the will smith chris rock incident he said hey you want to see a celebrity slap here it is yeah oh, oh man right through the kisser <laughs> right i saw it live I, i'll never forget yeah well, you're watching that live yes yeah. i watched it yeah back in 1982 and then here we uh kaufman comes back yeah just uh swearing on live tv back then <laughs> going crazy this is i can i remember I, i'm sorry i'm sorry where he does that stuff this is unbelievable uh, what a andy coffin was a genius too a classic yeah. angle between the uh pop culture and the wrestling world yeah, in 82 yes. before 85. mr hollywood in those times in nashville the way he would talk to the crowd used to be kind of funny yeah andy you know, kaufman right? and the intergender matches yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. one of a kind loved wrestling that's for sure <laughs> you know letterman here he's just going off and swearing like crazy and a, and a shout out to uh, Jim Carrey who portrayed Andy Kaufman right. in the movie Man Over the Moon, which was yeah, that was good. fantastic. Yeah. Um, good movie. If you haven't oh. seen that, it covers oh. this part of this uh, relationship <laughs> with Jerry Lawler. And there yeah. goes Andy Kaufman uh, running in the uh, NBC so studios yeah. there in New York City. It was great. Yeah, a lot of fans will never forget this. Always talk about it to this day. But I mean. That just didn't happen on TV no. back then. That was great. Um, it's one o'clock in the morning too. It's happening. When it know? came to late yeah. night, where now this was not, that obviously was before Jay Leno. But when it came to late night, were you more of a Leno guy or a Letterman guy? Uh, Letterman for me. Letterman for me as well. What about you, Chris? Are you more Leno or Letterman? I liked them both, but yeah, yeah I watched Jay a lot more. Yeah, I'm and, so uh, old that I got pissed at because I was like Carson. Carson, yeah, yes, yeah, of Leno, course, so I Carson. Leno. I remember a little yeah. bit of Carson towards the tail end of his mm. career. I was still pretty young, um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like it's not the same. I'm not a big I know. Jimmy Fallon. I don't watch any of it. And... No, it's over. I I started was... when Fallon came on. It was good, and he yeah. still is good, but I just don't follow it a lot. So They're not know, quite I was great then, you know. That was like night. TV and don't forget about Conan. Conan, Conan, was the man Conan, Conan yes. O'Brien, who yeah. should have been uh, Letterman's replacement. Um, or instead I'm sorry. of going to TBS. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I had maybe I had that mixed up, but yeah, they, he he had to go to TBS because he kind of suffered the same fate as CBS David Letterman did. Screwed him, you know. After yeah, and in the case of Letterman, of course, NBC screwed him. But yeah, I always enjoyed that, and, and he always had wrestlers on uh, besides Jerry Lawler. I know he had some others on. Uh, they all do, but uh, yeah, just uh, just some good memories there of those days, absolutely. Um, and of course, we want to get to our uh, enhancement talents or our jobber of the week. And um, you know, as, as George Shire said too during our interview, you know, that's what these guys were paid to do. And and we hope that you know, I, I hope that the intention here that we, you know, again, we have some fun with these guys' haircuts and outfits mm -hmm. and shit, absolutely. But want to give them some some love too because these are the guys that are like the uh, the unsung heroes, if you will. Uh, and here, our, our enhancement talent, or jobber, whatever you want to call him, is Mr. Omar Atlas, who also celebrated a birthday two days ago. Uh, uh -huh. So perfect that it, it worked out. By coincidence, I looked up somebody to, to profile today, and it uh, happened to be his birthday two days ago. So uh, happy birthday to Omar Atlas. Uh, Omar Atlas had a record of one win, one draw, and 48 losses in the WWF. His one win came against a uh, former Falls Count Anywhere guest, Mr. Dusty Wolf. Mm. That took place uh, January 26, 1988 at an MSG show. Um, but yeah, Mr. Omar Atlas, I uh, wanted to just give him some props there for what he did uh, back in the day. I remember um, the name. Yeah, he had many different names. Uh, the Super Gladiator, Super Steel. Um, but out of uh, Venezuela, a uh, veteran of, or uh, right out of Venezuela there. 
and um, you know we, he's still going strong today. So uh, again, happy birthday to him, and uh, props to uh, Mr. Omar Atlas uh, for doing the job, if you will, and uh, putting those uh, big names over back in the day. But you know, and the funny thing too is, as we talked to, um, as we had our guests last week, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, they they didn't want to. They didn't want to just go in there and get their asses kicked, and they wanted to prove that you know even though we're coming in here to uh, to wrestle you guys and, and put you over, they, they weren't going to get pushed around, and they they made sure that they made their presence felt. You know, just remember as you know, they were big, big to us. Those guys. Yeah. I mean, they were. You saw them every week. I mean, they were huge. I mean, I know them all. You probably you guys all right. you know you remember them yeah. all. They remember them just as much as I remember the stars. No right. question. Yeah. They were huge. And that, that's what kind of prompted me to, to, to do this. Like, I, like well, I remember those guys that were, yeah. you, know, the, you know, nobody really knows those guys. A lot of our viewers out there like it too. It's great. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you didn't grow up in the era that we did and you look back at some of these classic matches and watch some of the old superstars and wrestling challenges, uh, wrestling challenge shows, um, and, you, and you see these guys like, oh, who's that guy? Who's that guy? That's what we try to do. So Omar Atlas, we want to give him some love there. And uh, as we wrap up here, guys, um, a great – uh, show as always and um, you know our birthday celebrations Chris we're, we're another year older man yeah um, you know we got some I got the grays coming in I know we got the grays catching up <laughs> man but that's the uh, just the, a number the, just the, a that's number that's right man the nature of life so uh, thank you for all the birthday love um, and um, get ready to be crippled at 50 that's what I hear I, that's what I, hear. I was dreading 40 now I'm five years away from 50 and it's like uh oh yeah. What's going to happen next? No, you'll be I'm going to have a bad knee as soon as I wake up you know, <laughs> yeah. that morning. Uh, that number. And uh, real quick, before we go, our friend Elena DePaulo, John, uh, shout out uh, and want to share things about her. Any updates or progress yes. there? Or? There are. There is an update where we were going to have her on the show last Monday on, mm. on uh, uh, Citizens United, but she was, uh, unfortunately, she was really, she got really sick. She got the flu. It put her in the hospital. Oh, jeez. Um, but she battled off through it as usual, and uh, she's fine. She's back home. She's good. doing good. Good, good. Um, as that goes. But of course, seven one six eight nine eight five zero zero one is the number to call. Elena needs a kidney. She beat leukemia. While beating leukemia, she then um, had kidney failure, and her kidney now she's on dialysis. Um, she's very. She's in her thirties. She's got a beautiful little baby. Her her husband. And every time we talk to her, every single time, as these things happen, even when she didn't want dialysis, you know, we talked to her that day. That she was actually going in to get it, get it surgically put in the yeah. next day, mm -hmm. and she was on our show, still happy and looking forward to the day where she doesn't have to need it anymore. So seven one six eight nine eight five zero zero one. No matter where you are in the country, because I know we're watching from all over the world. It's the World Wide Web. Uh, please call that number, and be a donor if you could. If you can't, go to uh, Gorillas Inc. pages, um, all the shows, find Elena DePaulo's thing, and just share it all over. Yeah, she's a fighter, and uh, mm -hmm. you know we wish her the best going forward, and, and hopefully uh, uh, we can make that happen for her just by getting the word out here on this show and, and our other platforms here at Gorillas Inc. Speaking of that, John, you guys had the uh, the great sports show, Goal Getters, had yeah. uh, you know some good debates going. So if you guys haven't uh, caught up on that, be sure to check out Goal Getters with Julio and Scott, along with John Restino here. Uh, but as we wrap up here, I want to say thank you again to Robin, as always, for sharing content, Wade for production of the show, and uh, Chris for the uh, the vault of wrestling expertise and DVDs that you bring each and every week. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you to everybody who uh, took some time out to view us and to check out uh, our great guests that we have each and every week and to just check us out. And we got on, one uh, next week, so stay tuned for sure. Yeah, we're, we don't want to confirm anything yet, but we're hoping to have, uh, well, well, we'll just leave it as a teaser. Just, uh, mm. just stay tuned. We're going to have a guest uh, as well next week uh, that a lot of folks may recognize or uh, be familiar with. So, uh, again, thank you for joining us here on Falls County Anywhere podcast. Have a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you again soon.